Hey, everybody. We got the clicker. My name is Zuri. I am a technical artist. I've been using 3D modeling software and digital media production stuff for like 18 years or something like that now. And it's kind of crazy because we rise through the ranks, we learn a little bit more, we challenge ourselves with new things, and as we increase that challenge, we also take longer to finish projects. And now that I've been working in the AAA game industry for over two years, I'm under NDA with almost everything that I make, and it takes massive teams to produce almost anything. And it's kind of sad because I come home and my friends are telling me, hey, what, uh, what are you working on? And I'm like, I can't tell you. So it's kind of nice to, when I get home, work on projects that take it way back, way back, even before I was 3D modeling, and do something a little more artsy craftsy. Uh, that is really easily attainable and I can finish it in an afternoon. And that led me back to an old passion of mine, paper crafting. Paper crafting is, uh, can take many forms and you can use this for all kinds of fun things such as cosplay or just making a fun desk ornament. And it's a pretty simple process really if you're used to UV unwrapping, it's actually kind of like that but in reverse although you have to kind of do it both ways. You UV unwrap, you print it out, you cut it, you fold it, and you glue it back together, refolding it back together. This is an example of a project that I made for my girlfriend. She raises rabbits, and I thought that this would be a fun gift for her, so I 3D modeled this rabbit with uh, fairly low, relatively low poly, and used the built-in paper unwrapping algorithm that comes with Blender's add-on to uh, produce a bunch of paper sheets cut it out, glue and fold it together, and man, it took a lot longer than I thought it would. And you get a lot of cool things like this. Uh, lately, most people go right to thinking about 3D printing when they want to turn a 3D model into an asset that they can uh, have sitting on their desk, which is great, but we do still have access to paper crafting, and it can be really rewarding because you're not really limited by the size of the printer bed. You get a cool asset to sit on your desk, and if your girlfriend raises rabbits, you get a happy girlfriend. So you can see here, actually, those are the six sheets that the paper algorithm uh, was able to unfold. Uh, we live in the US, so we're using letter-sized paper, and that's what fit on six sheets. The other cool thing about paper craft is that you're not just limited to uh, just white cardstock. You can use other uh, fun crafts paper. In this case, we did a fun little trophy. We were doing a booth reminiscent of the Kentucky Derby, so we modeled the uh, trophy from the Kentucky Derby and printed it out on gold foil cardstock. That was a lot of fun. And then a friend of mine is putting together a video game that is retro-inspired and has a little robot character that you run around in. And I was looking at it going like, hmm, he's kind of boxy, kind of low poly. That would be a fun project to do for his birthday. So I put this guy on the right over here. I uh, put him together uh, with the paper crafting process and was able to do it in full color, which was a lot of fun. So one of the things that I like about this is that this process can kind of scale to different levels. So let's give it a try at the most basic level over here. What we are going to need, it's actually pretty simple. Most people have access to these kinds of tools. You're gonna need a printer and some cardstock. Even though it's called paper crafting, I don't recommend actually using paper because by the time you've mixed in glue and ink and all of that, it's going to tend to kind of have its structure compromised a little bit and crumple and fall apart and not really support its own weight. In the US, we weigh our cardstock by pound. I don't really know what this means, but when you're shopping for it, those are the numbers you'll see. You've got 65 pound, 110 pound, and it gets really thick. The 110 pound is great because when you're done putting it together, by the time you've folded and glued everything together, it's quite sturdy. Um, but it can be a little hard to work with, and I did find that the 65 pound is pretty nice. If you're doing the more basic form here, where you're gonna cut it out yourself, you're gonna need a precision knife and a cutting mat, and of course, some glue. And lastly, why we're all here, some software that's gonna help you unfold this guy. So Blender's got a built-in add-on, it's just called Export Paper Model. This add-on is actually really excellent because out of the box, it does most of the work for you. It will let you unfold. It will uh, automatically UV unwrap in a way that is compatible with paper crafting. And it lets you fit that into pieces of paper automatically so it's just completely uh, stress-free and you don't have to think about it. And if you're not in the US, it even works for other sizes of paper. And it will export this out to a PDF. 
let's see how to use this process to make the default cube. All right, we're just going to open up the preferences over here, go to the add-on section, search for paper, look at that, check the box. This guy is going to appear now in the sidebar under the paper tab, select the model that you would like to unfold, click the unfold button, you got a few options down here if you want to adjust the way in which it unfolds. And then you're going to export paper model and give it a name. Cubes is a pretty good name for a cube paper model. Make sure that you pick the correct paper. Again, in the US, that's going to be letter. Export to PDF, and it comes out right away, ready to print. And print. Yoink. And then we are going to get our precision knife and cutting mat. And I have sped this up because it's incredibly boring if I didn't. We're just going to cut around all of the cutting lines that it's printed out for us here. And then we've got to fold along all of the folding lines. This uh, is a process that you don't want to underestimate because it does take almost as much time, if not more time, than the cutting part itself. You can see me kind of crimping along the edges there, kind of pre-folding along the tabs. Once you have finished folding all of the tabs, you can assemble it into the shape and make sure that everything's all good. Then we're going to glue it together. My method here is to actually use some of the scraps from the leftover piece. We're going to use some glue. And then I use even more scraps as a little wand to kind of paint on the glue. I actually did a bunch of research looking for what the best glue for this kind of thing would be. And there were all kinds of suggestions from different pack, paper crafting hobbyists. And some of them are too tacky. Some of them dry too slow. Some of them get under your fingernails, and it's gross. And uh, what it all came back down to, honestly, was just some Elmer's glue. It turns out to be really great for this stuff. It dries very fast. And if you do get it on your skin, you can just kind of rub your fingers together, and it comes right off. And when we're done, we got a default cube. Pretty exciting stuff. And there we go. There's a default cube. Now, if that part excited you and you're like, oh boy, I'm ready to go home and try that, you can. Uh, there's a, lot, a bit left in the conference, so you might not want to do that. But let's try something a little bit more complicated because as much as we love it, the default cube is not really the most complicated model out there. And admittedly, neither is Suzanne, but let's give her a try just because we all love her so much. There's a bunch of considerations we need to take into account when picking a model to do in Papercraft. Uh, first of all, Suzanne's eyes are non-contiguous. They are actually uh, separate pieces of geometry that are just kind of phased through her head. And while that works in 3D space, it doesn't work so well in real life. So by the time you are going to print that out, unless you can find a way to phase two pieces of cardstock through each other, it's not going to work so well. She's also pretty high poly. She doesn't look like it, but Suzanne actually has 500 faces. And in the world of papercraft, where you're going to have to be responsible for folding all that together, that is pretty high poly. And she also has this last phenomenon, which is that she's got faces that are not all flat. We'll come back to that in a minute. So to solve these first two problems, the non-contiguous part and the fact that she's pretty high poly, we're just going to do some retopology. And if you haven't given this a, a shot yet, Blender's latest versions actually have a retopology overlay, which is beautiful. It lets you see the low poly over top of the high poly while you are retopologizing. And over here is our final version, well, semi-final version of the 3D model. We can see on the left there that Suzanne has 500 faces in her original configuration. And with my retopologized version there, we've got 94 faces. Now, doing just some rough math, that cube, which has six faces, took me about 15 minutes, which means it's about two and a half minutes per face. So we're really saving ourselves a lot of time just by cutting down on the number of faces. So you can see here my estimates. I would have taken almost 21 hours to do default Suzanne over there, and just shy of four hours for the retopologized version. All right, cool. So we fixed those first two problems. Let's take a look. Are we ready? Well, if we click that unfold button, we're going to be met with this error. You have got 82 twisted polygons. Twisted and evil. Uh, not so much evil, but they aren't going to be very compatible with actually uh, paper crafting and printing these out. So what does twisted even mean? Well, the, the truth here is that most polygons are not flat. If we take a look at triangles versus quads over here, I've turned on the cavity shading mode for this example. And you can actually see that in Euclidean geometry, most uh, polygons here, triangle, triangles, 
any three points are going to make a coplanar surface, so that's going to lay out flat very nicely. But quads, uh, as soon as you add a fourth point to the polygon, that fourth point is not guaranteed to be coplanar with the rest of the model. Blender actually has a distortion overlay of under while you're in edit mode. Go to uh, mesh analysis, turn on distortion, and it will let you see color uh, describing to you how distorted or twisted those polygons are. And you know, red is evil, so maybe it is evil after all. Uh, and the more twisted this is, the less compatible it's going to be with 3D printing, and you really don't have, or sorry, uh, paper crafting, <laughs> uh, which is you really don't have very much elbow room there at all. We need to get rid of that distortion, otherwise it's not going to lay out flat on the page. We could triangulate the twisted polygons, but we just did all this work to uh, retopologize it for two reasons. One, to reduce the poly count, and two, um, partially, I did say I'm a technical artist, and I love good edge flow, good topology, and all of our quads, if we tri triangulate them, it doesn't look as nice as it used to. And we've basically just doubled our poly count, therefore increasing the amount of time that we're going to take there. So that's no good. Let's take a look again at the one we were working with just a minute ago. And looking at that, we're like, okay, well, you know, how many, how many distorted polygons could there really be? It can't be that bad. Let's turn on our display. Okay, it's pretty bad. So we need to flatten these out. One way to flatten these out is to actually grab the entire face, scale along its local normal, and the average normal of all the vertices there will let it flatten out completely, therefore, therefore flattening out that polygon, which is great. The trouble is that there's 124-ish polygons on this thing, and that means I have to manually do that that many times. So. I wrote a Python script to do it for me, which is pretty exciting. So th this just iterates over all of the polygons that you've got selected, and it scales them along their local normals. And here I've just added a blend shape to help you see the difference here, and you can actually see that it's blending between one and the other there, and we've got rid of all the distortion. We've also kind of gotten rid of some of the shapes that I liked, so I did one final cleanup pass here, added a few extra edge loops to alleviate some of that distortion there, and this is the final topology. Now we're almost good to go. If you want to do this at home, you could probably just say, cool, we'll hit the unfold button and export. Trouble is you would get this. These are two big nasty islands that are a little bit hard to work with. They've got a few problems. You can see over on, the right si uh, over on the right side over here that even some of the tabs are overlapping each other, which is not going to do so well when you try to cut those out while it's simultaneously being a tab and a face that you're trying to unfold. There, uh, this will, of course, respect the UV seams that you've put together, so you can customize it a little bit, but I started to run into limitations of this built-in add-on. You can't really live preview the result you're going to get, where the tabs are, how it fits on the page, and I just I wanted a little bit more control over it than that. So geometry nodes to the rescue. Lots of geometry nodes. So essentially, I remade the unfolding algorithm and I, I'm sorry, I didn't make, remake the unfolding algorithm. I made, remade the part that produces tabs, and I remade the part that is going to lay it out onto pages and produce the cut and fold lines. So that way I can take direct control over it and get exactly the result I want while reducing wasted numbers of pages and getting uh, a live preview so I can get the best results possible. Uh, when I first started putting this together, I thought I would have a chance to really break down the nodes, and then I did a run-through of my talk, and I realized that I would have run out of time almost immediately. So we're just going to take a look at some of the fun groups that I've got here. This one will let us flatten the model out to UVs. It's actually pretty cool and pretty straightforward. If you split out the faces, and then you set the position of the vertices to the position of the UVs, it, uh, it's pretty much as simple as that. You can lay out your model to match the UVs. The next thing is that I needed to be able to create the tabs that go along with the model, because if you don't have tabs, you got nothing to glue back together. So this piece uh, remembers the original edges before it was split and unfolded, remembers which ones come in a pair, then it extrudes them outwards, we scale inwards along their respective centers to produce the uh, tapering effect, and then we delete one from each pair so that we only have one tab on uh, one side. And then a piece that I alluded to in the name of this talk, but really haven't gotten to yet, which is that 
uh, cut and fold lines are going to be important here because cutting them out cutting out the model yourself is a pretty time consuming part as well and i have a cutter plotter machine at home which will, which will trace vector lines and cut it out for me so long as we provide it with cut and fold lines so uh, i made a second geometry nodes network here that remembers how kinked the original uh, edges were and based on that will produce dotted fold lines and it will produce solid lines around the outside of every island and the super cool thing about the way this all comes together is that based on geometry nodes, I get a live preview including texture where I can lay it out on the page. And the last piece here is a freestyle render. There's a plugin that will let you take a freestyle render, produce vector lines based on those tagged edges, and output an SVG file that goes along with your rendered image. So I render these out with three components here. We get the texture. We get the SVG file. And the last one here, again, is a piece I didn't really talk about, which is registration marks. So the cutter plotter machine that I have is able to scan, find these registration marks, and use that to make sure that the texture that's printed on the page lines up to where it's going to cut the lines. Because there's always going to be a little bit of variation in the way that you uh, load it into the machine. And those registration marks make sure that the lines get cut in the right spot. So. We are just going to run through and see a time lapse of putting together Suzanne. She's ready to go. Thank you so much. And I don't want to fly this back on the plane with me, so whoever can catch the best. All right, I'm going to throw it in a general direction, hopefully not right down the aisle. And we got a default cube as well. Nice. People actually caught them. That's great. <laughs> 